I read that script perfectly. <laughs> So why am I here today? That is the key question. Oh, sorry, Brian. Thank you. So why am I here today? That's the key question. I'm a member of Toastmasters, just like you are. Three years ago, I came to San Francisco. Two and a half years ago, I decided to join Toastmasters. I made that decision because I was making a personal move in my life where I said I would like to make the move from doing speaking part-time to actually doing it professionally. So over the past two and a half years, literally, I would say 40% of what I've learned and created on how to become a professional speaker, I have learned from Toastmasters. So whenever someone from Toastmasters asks me to give back, it's not a matter of giving back, it's paying a debt that I still owe millions from because I've learned so much from the individuals, many individuals in this room, and from all of the experience that I've had during my two and a half years of Toastmasters. So that's kind of a pre-introduction of really why I'm here, not so much the credentials that you've heard. Brilliant Diamond Speech Crafting. Where does this concept and idea come from? Well, actually, I was working with someone from Toastmasters, and in our conversations about how she could organize her presentation, I was saying, you know, one of the things that I noticed is you've got to have a really sharp, really sharp opening. It's got to be the kind of sharp opening that will literally kind of cut into someone. And then it's got to have a sharp closing. And as you can see, Eureka Bell started going off in my head. It was like, wait, sharp opening, sharp closing. That's actually a diamond. So even the origins of this particular workshop, which is the basis workshop of, of what I'm building actually my first book and a full set of presentations on, comes from doing an evaluation with a fellow Toastmasters member. So first of all, I want to have everyone, I know it's a little hard here, but take the stuff down off your lap. If you had a table, it would be easier. I actually want everyone to stand up and literally to reach into your pocket. Or if you have a purse, you can reach into your purse. And I want you to just start yelling out. What are the things that you find in your pocket or in your purse? Keys? Toastmaster's badge. Toastmaster's badge. How many people have a How many people have a speech in your pocket? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Okay. Now I expect that since this is an advanced club, all the hands would be up. Often with beginning speakers, people don't realize all of you have a speech in your pocket. Your pocket speech. You can sit down now. Thank you. What we're going to go through today is the Brilliant Diamond Speech Crafting Technique, which is just one technique that you can utilize to help you actually put your speech together. Now, there are many techniques out there, but I've found that each and every one of them will fit within this particular format. One of the ones I love is the Decker format, for example, where you use little post-it notes. You put all your ideas on post-it notes, and then when you're done, you put them all out, and you look for groups, and you put them in groups, and you put them on a piece of paper in a certain outline. I've even done the Decker method using this same particular one. What we're going to do today, in other words, what are the outcomes that I have an hour and a half from now that I will have with you, or what? First of all, you will have an understanding of how to actually use the Brilliant Diamond Speech Crafting Method. So you'll be able to know how to use it, actually get a chance to practice it, and what I think more important, because this is an advanced Toastmasters Club, you will have the ability to show someone else how to use this. Because this is a basic format that anyone can use. The second thing is, I want you to find three points, at least. Three points that you either agree with me on, or you say, Andrew, you're a complete idiot and that is absolutely wrong. Or maybe new information. The reason is I want to make sure that you are involved in this workshop as a workshop. So you're constantly thinking about the information that's coming out. Resonate with it. it, does it do you agree with it? Is it new information that you can learn from? Or is this something, um, as I said before, that you, know, you say I'm a complete idiot? That's fine as long as you can prove it. But I want to make sure that you're not going to leave this room until I see those three points on your notes. And let me repeat that. You will not leave this room until I see those three points on your notes. In the last workshop, two people thought they can get away, and they had to wait in the back and refill out so I could see those three points, all right? So make sure in your notes you have three points, at least, that have resonated with you somehow. And then the last thing is you're going to leave with a brand diamond pocket speech in your pocket. Now, this is an advanced group, so many of you already have those pocket speeches. So this will be just a chance, an opportunity for you to take that pocket speech and go ahead and format it again so it will add to your ability to give that pocket speech. If there's someone in this room that does not have a pocket speech, then you will have, once you leave this room, a pocket speech that you will be able to give at any point or at any time. So those are the three desired outcomes. What is the Brilliant Diamond methodology? It's basically a three full step methodology. The first step is to craft your brilliant speech. And you'll see how all this has to do with the diamond to polish 
your brilliant speech. And then finally, to showcase your brilliant speech. How many ladies in the room have a diamond? Anyone have a diamond? Okay. Now, when, when you have that diamond, you don't just kind of like put it in your pocket, right? You, you showcase it. It's out there for the world to see. Well, this is a three-step process. First of all, you actually have to make that diamond. Then you've got to polish it to make sure it really shines. And then the last step, of course, is to walk around and, you know, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. <laughs> You know, yesterday I met a very nice young lady at an event I went to, and the first thing I looked for, was like, yes, no diamond. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna, um, we're going to just focus on the first one here, the crafting part of it in this. And this is actually, like I said, it's a full day, kind of two-hour workshop for each of those. We're going to focus on the first one. Brilliant Diamond Method. This is kind of an overview of the Brilliant Diamond Method. You have the sheet in front of you, which explains a lot of it. But there's something that I noticed when I first started thinking about this diamond. Now, how many men in the room have ever bought a diamond before lately? Okay. What's, what's, the, what's the investment you're asked to, to give for a, a diamond for a woman? $15. <laughs> <laughs> diamond and diamond nail are two different things, but you know, some people don't know that. That's okay, that's okay. So what is, what's the, what, what is the beers trying to tell you? It's the 44 months salary. So many months of your salary, right? So it's, it's a large investment, right? Same thing with the speech. A speech is an investment, okay? For the women in the room, when you receive a diamond, you just don't want to get any diamond, right? There's certain criteria that you're looking for in that diamond. And that criteria is the basic five C's for the diamond. Now, any diamond that you get, you want to look at what? You want to look at the cut of the diamond. You want to look at the color of the diamond. You want to look at the clarity of the diamond. The carrot of the diamond and the quality of the diamond. Well, guess what? A speech is very similar. The difference with the speech is you're going to be looking for something similar, but slightly different. Instead of the cut, the type of speech. Yesterday, I had to give what I'm giving now as a two-hour presentation in one minute. <laughs> Did I give it the same way? Absolutely not. I had to find a way to find just the right teaser to tell the audience so they would want to come to something like this. But it was still the same information. I just had to figure out what was the key thing. Sometimes I have to give it, again, like Taiwan, I gave it as a 15-minute workshop. I'm not quite how sure they called it a workshop, but it was a 15-minute workshop. It's 15 minutes, very different. I've given it as a seven-minute speech at a Toastmasters club. I've given this in a four-hour format as opposed to a two-hour format. So depending on what you're actually going to write, obviously it's going to be a little bit different. Just like you can have a large diamond, small diamond, different kind of shapes of your diamond. The color of the diamond is purpose. Is it just for information? Is it for persuasion? Is it humor? As we have a humorous uh, expert in the room, you know, obviously your delivery and how you write it, everything is going to be very different for a humorous speech. So that's the purpose of the speech. The clarity, the clarity or the flow of the speech. We've seen a lot of people who have very good skills, but it just doesn't kind of flow very well. Or they have ideas in the head and the logic just doesn't flow very well. Which you'll see in the Brilliant Diamond Craft and how it will help the logic flow within your speech. Carrot is the content, the weight. It's kind of actually what, what was said earlier. I've been to so many motivational speaking seminars and you sit there and you listen like, yeah, all right. And you walk out, yeah, yes, sir, he was great. Yeah, and then two days later, yeah, he was great. And then three days later, it's like, yeah, he was great, but what did he say? <laughs> when people call me a motivational speaker, I immediately say no. I have a motivational style because that's my personality, but I'm not a motivational speaker. Why? Because I have content. <laughs> not just ideas, okay? That's why I say when you walk away, you will walk away with a pocket speech in your pocket, okay? It's not up to me if you use it, but you will walk away with something that you can use tomorrow, okay? Yesterday I went to an event and I walked away and I changed some of the things that I did for this workshop and some of the things I will do for a workshop on Tuesday because there was content, all right? So the carrot, do, do you want to give your, your loved one a half carrot diamond or three carrot diamond, all right? Same thing with the speech. You're giving the audience a gift. That's why it's called giving a speech. So make sure it's got some good carrots in there. And then the last thing is the quality and that is how you deliver your speech. In an advanced Toastmaster Club, I'm sure you're aware of all the wonderful different ways and different strategies of delivering your speech. But this is the analogy that I realized why a diamond was exactly like, or very similar to, a speech. But more importantly, it gave me, and I'll tell you, I have ADHD. So for me, using visual things and visual analogies 
and words that I can easily remember are very important. And I realized it gave me a very easy platform to use, a very easy, in a sense, glasses to use to look at how I give a speech. So it doesn't matter if you have that moment, you're like, I'm kind of stuck, I'm not sure what I want to talk about today. You can use that as a format to start drafting your speech. Or let's say, you know, it's an advanced club. You know, you're award winners, you're professionals, you give speeches all the time. This is a way you can look at the speech that you've already written and just make sure, yep, that's there, that's there, that's there, and check it out very easily. And you don't even need the words. With just this diagram alone, after you go to and understand all the elements of it, you'll be able to use it. And that's a kind of visual diagram that will stay in your head. You don't have to worry about the words. And I know if you went to any public speaking course, they usually teach opening, body, conclusion, tell them what you're going to say, say it, tell them what you said. I think because of that, that's why we have so many mediocre speeches. It is more than that. And there's some key elements missing in that one, two, three. And I think that this diamond format also shows it and covers that so that those key elements will not be missed. What's the first one? The first one is any speech should have some type of opening that grabs attention. For example, what did I do at the beginning of this workshop to grab attention? I stand up. Stand up. Okay. Now, what is it, when I have you stand up, what does that do? It breaks your way from where you were. What do you see? I said it just breaks you away mentally from where you were. Okay, before. breaks you away, gives you something different, kind of strikes you to a new position. What else? Wakes you up. Wakes you up. If you're a little tired, you know, you might have lunch like I just did, getting, you know, blood's going down here instead of up here. Okay, what else? Get you thinking. I actually told you to actually tactile. Go in. Reach into your pocket. Some of you actually did. You reach into your pocket. Things are moving around, all right? It gets you to thinking. And then it makes you go, why is he having us do this? See? So you have to have some type. For example, I can start off like this. What is this? How many of you have this? Every one of you need this. That's an opening that I'll use for HPL. This is an HPL pack. By the way, anyone need to do their HPL here? You need to do your HPL? We need to, who's going to start first? I've got this. You need to pack it? Yes. Okay, you have your HPL pack. <laughs> And you're going to see how that's going to tie into something later, too. So that's one opening you can do. There's an opening that I saw, for example, there is a program I went to which was a prejudice reduction program. And it started off, in the, uh, this one person gave up to give his presentation of his culture. But this prejudice reduction work pro program, it was the evening, and everyone came in and gave some element of their culture. This guy came in, he kind of had on a hoodie, and all of a sudden he went, And it was like, whoa, whoa, what's, what's going on? <laughs> but he was a member of a historically black fraternity. And he was showing how stepping was one element of how all African American communications tends to be very vibrant. Nothing is kind of calm and making. If it's clothes, if it's singing, everything has like this pulse and vibrancy to it. That was his opening. Grand opening. Sharp opening caught everyone's attention. There's a particular speech I started off with in Toastmasters when I did my opening. Uh, my icebreaker speech where I took the lectern. I started over here and I said, hello, my name is Anthony Hogan. I picked up the lectern for the next portion of the speech and moved it over here. And I said, oh wait, I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong analogy. Let me go back. Okay, there's a speech I started with at Toastmasters, not my icebreaker, another one where I was actually used the, the um, Pledge of Allegiance. As a matter of fact, I did this for Beta Bay. And I used the Pledge of Allegiance and I started off with my D.C. Nationals jersey on, my D.C. Nationals hat, and I put it on and I just simply said, a pledge of allegiance to the flag, to the United States of America. And I just did the pledge of allegiance. I didn't say anything else. And again, it was a sharp opening because it caught people's attention. And they're like, well, where's he going with this? And it was a whole discussion about how Washington, D.C. doesn't have voting rights in Congress. So you have to have some type of opening that brings the audience in. It doesn't have to be a crazy one like I do. It could be a simple one. It could be... I specifically found this on the way here. It could be something like this. Ten years ago, I was at the United Nations building in New York City. And I got a chance to experience firsthand the chaos that New York City went through on 9-11. It could be something dramatic, something real. It could be what someone yesterday called a startling statistic. Did you know that 5,000 homeless people alone live in a two-square block of downtown San Francisco? It just has to be something that 
pulls in that attention. And I'll tell you one of the clues to sharp openings, it doesn't have to be your own, borrow it from somebody else. <laughs> okay? I have borrowed at least half of my sharp openings from other people. If I see something great, I look at it and make it my own. And that's how, and that's how I can make sure that I always have a sharp opening. Even if you're at work and you think you're doing a boring presentation at work, find a way to create a sharp opening. The second part of your opening is your preview. Now, a lot of people do the basics, you know. First thing I'm going to tell you, the second thing I'm going to tell you, the third thing I'm going to tell you. Or, for example, as I said, you know, you can actually move places. So you can say, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the history of why we're here at Toastmasters. Then we're going to talk about why Toastmasters and this particular club, club is excellent today. And then next we're going to talk about how we're going to make it better for the future. So you can actually use the physical space to actually show as a preview of what you're actually going to do. But you have to have some type of preview. Do you have to tell them everything that you're going to say? No. Your preview can just be the thesis of what you're going to talk about. But you have to pull them in. Today, everyone in this room is going to leave with a diamond ring. You want to know how? Wait and see. You have to give them something, let them know. Today, every one of you is going to leave with a pocket in your speech. Give them some direction, some roadmap of where you're going. You don't always have to give them the exact thing. Sometimes people will tell you that, okay, tell them what you're going to say. One, two. Eh, that can get kind of boring. Some people, I even heard someone a few days ago in a speech say, I actually hate that, don't do that again. You know? There are different ways that you can uh, pick and choose how you do it. But just make sure you somehow either introduce just the main purpose or give a preview of all the main points. The thing that most people miss with the sharp opening or with the opening is that they think it's just this part. They have to forget about the sharp opening in that second part, which is give them a roadmap, give them a guide to where you're actually going. At this point, I also should say, and I did forget to say, if there are any questions, don't wait to the end. Bring them up here, because we are, you're all advanced members, or most of you are advanced members. So there's going to be points and ideas and questions and suggestions that you have also. So please bring them up as we go along. Okay, so any questions or points or suggestions or anything you're crazy on the sharp opening or on the opening of your speech, the two parts, the sharp opening and the speech preview. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that we can uh, use some, some kind of a sharp opening in work presentations, mm -hmm. but normally when, uh, not as a presentation, but in a meeting which you're holding, right? Mm -hmm. how, how would you... Uh, Give me an example of a topic for your meeting, and I'll show you. Say system integration. Okay, give me an example of a topic that I'll understand. <laughs> so, like five minutes doing five different things, and you know, we, we need to make sure everybody's on track and you get stuff done together. Okay, so how many people here today are working on track number one? Please raise your hand. No, actually, please raise your left hand. Okay, go ahead and keep your hands up. How many people today are working on track number two? Please raise your right hand. Okay, now how many people are working on track number three? I want you to stand up. Get the point? So you're not doing anything crazy. I don't like to do crazy dramatic things because it's my personality. But there are ways that you can find to create a sharp opening, even within a business scenario. And in that case, you do the same thing as I did with the pockets thing. You get them actually moving. And then, you know, got some standing, some left hand, some right hand. I don't know what you're going to do for the other two. That's why I stopped. But, you know, <laughs> right leg up, whatever. I mean, you, you'll find something to do. And then everyone's kind of looking around. And then you say, now everyone look around. Okay? That's how you can actually do a sharp opening for a business meeting that's dealing with five different topics. And then you can say, at the end of this meeting, I want everyone to be able to say we're doing the same project and we won't have a left hand, a right hand, a stand up, and a sit down. Okay? Other questions? Suggestions? Next point. This is the main stuff that everybody knows about a speech. This is stuff I like to go through the quickest. Three main points of a speech. Uh, is, uh, this is an example of what as I was supposed to do before but I screwed up on when I did the icebreaker at the Toast, at Rhino Toastmasters and I said, my name is Anthony Hogan, I picked up a lectern for the second point, I went and said, uh, ich heiße uh, Anthony in German and then I said, mi nombre es Antonio and I talked about how those three different languages affected my life. You have your three different points. The key here is not the points, the key is, this goes back to the content. What are the pillars that you have that back up those points? So anyone know what this is? Seen that somewhere? I know you all live, live, live a little south of the city, but you may have seen it in the city. Anyone? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a um, oh, shit. yes, what is it, Sam? Palace of Fine Arts. And I love this one, I saw it, and I took a picture specifically because here you have this really heavy topic, but it's being held up by the pillars. So in other words, when you have your pillars that are, uh, when you have your points, your pillars that are supporting your points, Make sure that they're logically supporting your points. If you're not 100% sure, run it by someone. Ask someone. 
I love email. Send, a quick, send out a quick email to make sure that that point really brings home what you want to say. One of the problems that I have is I tend to go off on tangents. So I have to make sure that my pillars are actually holding up what I want it to and not over here. You know, the pillar being in over here is not holding up your main point. So just make sure that you have those types of pillars. What are some of the pillars in a main point that you can get? What are some of the things that you can use to prove your point, your logic in the speech? Statistics. Statistics. What else? Personal. Personal stories. Others? Examples. Examples. Specific factual examples of it. Mm -hmm. What else? Come on, I thought this was an advanced school. Y'all disappoint me now. <laughs> I don't even know how many y'all read it off the board, because I'm not looking. I don't, I don't want to be disappointed, so I, I hope we, those are the three that are listed on the board. <laughs> What are some other pillars that you can use to support your point, support your case? Quotations. quotations. Mm -hmm. Why quotations? This is an interesting one. What's something that when you come into a room that you try to have but you don't always have with the audience? Connection? Credibility. Yeah. Credi who said it? Credibility. A quote can add to your credibility. Okay? So when you find a quote and you say it, even though Abraham Lincoln said it, even though Albert Einstein said it, that person's uh, credibility gets put into your presentation. So if you have a particular point that you want to say, and you can find a quote that really says it also by somebody, you know, more important than you, it does add credibility, you know, to what you're saying. So the key thing, like I said, is just make sure you use pillars. Now I want to point out two person, two pillars that I think are the strongest, and that's stories and personal experiences. And that's because on a even on a level of an intellectual level at work, people respond to stories. If it's at work, make it an experiential or factual story or a story about something marketing where someone actually achieved something. But people really respond to stories. And if you're like I am, like I told you, I have ADHD. I have a horrible memory. It's one of the reasons I don't use a lot of stories in my speeches. I don't remember half my own stories. And then when I do, I get something wrong and I tell it the next time and it's not quite the same. Well, you know what I've learned to do? Record them. So now I have lots of pictures. When I see something, I'm like, oh, this will be great. I make sure I take that picture. I have my camera with me always. I have my camera today. Someone's taking, is taking pictures for me is, which one? Priyanka. Priyanka is taking pictures for me. I always take pictures. Now, I've done that for years, but I never thought about recording my stories. Now, I record my stories. So that way, I don't have to remember them. I put them in a file, and they're recorded as an audio file, and then I can go back and use them later. Yes? I have a question now. I was wondering uh, if you know of any good source for stories on the web. What? <laughs> uh, that's a point we should throw out to everyone here. Does anyone know a good place where you can go and find stories on the web? Inspirationstories.com. They have a number of great stories that you can use, and you can even uh, find them by category if you like. Inspirationstories.com. Mm -hmm. It might be dot .net, I think it's .com. Okay. I read in the last issue of Toastmasters magazine. This is about quotations, 365quotes.com. Okay, 365quotes.com. Okay. Right. Another one that Patricia Fripp talks about, she says you don't have to use your story. You can say, Jennifer, last year you served under Mike Barcel. I don't know how you handle it, but tell us your best story about how you handle such a strong personality. You get that story from Jennifer, and then you say, you know, a friend of mine. <laughs> story about how you deal with a leader who has a, such a strong personality. <laughs> and then you tell them the story. Or you tell them the story, and if it's a group, you know, and go, and yep, you know who that was? It was Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> make sure you get, you know, get permission first. But the point is, they don't have to be your stories, too. So another source for stories are those people around you who have interesting lives or interesting perspectives on things. That's another source. Any others? I saw a hand in the back. Well, you kind of just made the point I was going to make about if your life is not interesting enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I made it a little bit nicer than if your life is not interesting enough. <laughs> I did want to point out something about telling stories at work. Mm -hmm. And one thing that ticks off people at work is the reference to, in my previous job, mm -hmm. I did blah, blah, blah. And because the immediate reaction is, I don't care what you did in previous job, but you're here. And especially in technology, it's you know, yeah, that was three years ago. It's different now. You've got to change. So, and work the positive just... stories about something that happened the, with the company or, work for, or yes. what works best. Take one more. I think at work, sometimes when you're talking to customer about what another customer did. Yes. So it, it doesn't have to be my own personal yes. or a friend's story, but 
Yeah, if they're looking to buy something, somebody else implemented it and they're happy, you get to talk to that person and use that story. Absolutely. That works real well. Yeah. Right, one more. So I think you probably came to a company for training, but we had a manager who learned the training that stories are good. And so for two more months, she would start her meetings by saying, I always love sharing stories, and she would go, here's her story. And so it's really important, I wonder if I hope you covered it, is it should be relevant and it should make sense. <laughs> should Somebody in a coaching class said you should start with a story. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> hold up your point, all right? You don't want to pillar this way, okay? Yeah. Pillar this way doesn't hold up. Matter of fact, it, it helps you crash, actually, okay? So make sure it's a straight standing pillar, all right? So next is a story, speaking of stories. Now, what's interesting with the story is that I'm not a professional storyteller. I, I really don't, like I said, I don't use stories that much because I forget them. But there's the three key elements to pretty much any story that can, you know, that you can make sure that you have in your story. And I give you a quick 10 second story to point it out. Uh, the key elements are, if you look on your paper, you'll see it better. It is your setup, your tension, and your resolution. It could be a 10 second story or a one hour story. As long as you have some setup, some type of tension to get people uh, feelings involved, and then you resolve it somehow. Okay? That's one of the things I love and hate about independent movies is sometimes at the end they don't resolve it. I'm like, oh, dude, come on. You know, I'm going to make it up now, but she died? You know, do they really get married? When you don't have that resolution, it just irks you. you know? So try to have those three points. So this is this one I always use for this type of workshop. It's like, I was walking down the street one day. So it was a bright, sunny day, which is surprising for San Francisco. And I noticed a woman across the street in a red dress. I'm a, you know, I'm a bachelor. Of course I'm going to notice a woman in a you know, nice red dress. So I kind of looked across the street, noticed her, nice looking. I was walking, all of a sudden I heard her scream. So of course I looked back over and she's running. I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? And she's just running, I'm thinking like, okay, she's got to be more late because she's like screaming. And then I notice that she's kind of pointing and yelling. And I look up further and I see a guy in a black hoodie. And he's running and he has a purse. Now this is San Francisco, but I don't think it's his purse. So she's running after him and I'm thinking like, gosh, should I go over and help? Uh, I don't know, maybe if I go over and help, then maybe I can get her phone number, I don't know. So I'm thinking like if I should go over and help, then all of a sudden I see this guy put out his hand and he closed lines the guy. The guy flips, the pulls the purse up, smacks on his back, the guy has his foot on his chest, the woman walks up, picks up the purse, and then a cop comes over. And I thought, wow, I'm so happy she got a purse, but God, I wish it was me. <laughs> <laughs> what was my setup in that? In that story, what did I use for the setup? Woman. Description. Description of the day. I gave you a little bit more about me, even in that description, because I told you maybe why I was looking at her. Okay? What was the tension? Whether we should go save her or not. That was, that was actually two little pieces of tension. I, I purposely put that in there. What were the two kinds of tension in that story? She was running. You don't know she why. was running. I didn't know why. So there was tension with her. What was going on with her? Why is this woman running? Then, then later on came my personal tension, which was, ooh, should I go help her? Right? In both cases, I, I might have caught two different parts of the audience. I might have caught that part of the audience going, yeah, I wonder if I would have helped her also. And I might have caught the part of the audience that just wanted to find out what was going to happen next. And then, of course, what was the climax? What was the resolution? You lost your Okay, so on the personal tension, I lost my opportunity to meet a pretty girl. And then in the storyline, what was the club? She was, got her purse back. She got her purse back. You see? So just as long as your story has those three elements. Now, for all of this, I'm going to point a caveat here. In all of this stuff, do you have to do every single one of these things? Do you have to have three points in your, in, you know, we said three points. Do you have to have three points, like in the last slide? Is that an absolute must? No. No. All right, but it's like cooking, and I'll tell you why. How many people here cook? Okay, so tell me that you have not spoken to yet, but who had their hands up for cooking? I want to see someone who has okay. I, I picked on you, but you haven't spoken yet. So what was the first thing you remember oh, no. cooking? Spaghetti sauce. Spaghetti sauce. The first time you cooked spaghetti sauce, did you follow a recipe? Yes. Okay, why? So that I got the right amount of everything. Because you didn't know what you were doing. You get the right amount of stuff, right? Okay. The thing about something like this, when it's like there are three points that you should follow. Well, in the beginning, and this is an advanced club, so hopefully you followed this basically in the beginning. But if you're explaining it to someone, you can say, follow the recipe first. Then when you become good at the recipe, then you can start adding a little bit more garlic. Throwing in a little bit of Parmesan cheese before instead of afterwards. You can start changing the recipe later. But at first, you have to become proficient at the basics. Then when you become proficient at the basics, you can say, oh, no, 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 I have a story where I go straight into tension and climax. I don't need to do the setup. 
And that's 100% true. You might be able to do that. But at least you understand what the purpose of the setup is, what the purpose of climax is, what the purpose of resolution. So then you can decide what do I want to take out and what do I want to put in. See, if Jennifer, you didn't have that recipe at first, you couldn't tweak the recipe and make it better later. Now, when you make spaghetti sauce now, is it the exact same way from the original recipe? No. no. And I bet you it tastes a whole lot better, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right, you see? So, okay, that's an invitation for spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> So a caveat to all of this is this is a model, and every model should simply be learned, but then tweaked after you figure out how to actually use it. So you can use a story uh, also as your entire body. I've seen many speeches which are just really good, especially some humorous speeches where really the whole story is the speech itself. And then the climax at the end is the biggest laugh off at the end, but it goes back and, and, uh, and looks at the whole story uh, from the beginning. Next is the Clark, excuse me, is the, uh, make sure to close sharp. Now, I'm going to give you an example from how I opened. Now, one of the ways I opened was what? I said do what? Or well, the way I opened was have you go into your pocket. How do you think I'm going to close? Have yourself put something in there. Something, something to do with the pocket. You don't know what yet. There's going to be something to do with the pocket. Now, I opened up another way to show you. I threw the packet down. How do you think I would close that speech about HPL? Thank you. <laughs> no, I wouldn't get back from that. I wouldn't get back from that. I would be like, okay, so Vish, tell me exactly what date are you starting on your HPL, and I would like to be one of your advisors. Yes, it all depends on Rita. <laughs> so you see how I tie it back? I start off by throwing the package, sharp opening, get your attention especially when it makes that smack on the ground. And I end by saying, let's go back to the packet. That would be my sharp closing for that speech. The speech where the person did, uh, 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 did, the, uh, did the step, he ended it, instead of doing the step, he put on some music and he danced his way out. So it was the same thing. It was body movement the whole time. Okay, he started with a step, ended with a dance. When I did the one with the Pledge of Allegiance, actually, how do I end that one? I don't even remember how I end that one, so let's, let's skip on that one. <laughs> um, uh, but the point is that when you come with a sharp closing, it should also be memorable. When you go to, let's say, a takeout place, you go to get your food, you make your order, you sit there, you wait in your car, you get your final food, what you get, that final food, is what you remember. In a speech, one of the things that Patricia Fripp says is that speak to be remembered and speak to be repeated. Well, if your opening and closing are sharp, people will remember it more. If your opening and closing are sharp and tied to each other, people will remember it more. One of the things I can't stand is when people go, okay, thank you, or that's it, that's all, you know. Even if you're going to do that, do it with, like, make it funny, and that's it, you know. Do it something so that it's powerful, that they know you're wrapping up, but it has to have some type of sharpness to it. Because especially at the end of a speech, energy goes down. And you want to spike it up really quick right before you end. I always want to reach out literally and like strangle people when they just go, and that's it, or thank you, or they end and they don't say anything, and you're going like, is there something next? And there's that, that, that really odd kind of two second pause, and then they start to turn away. Like, oh, okay, you're over. You know? <laughs> Find a sharp opening. Close as strong as you open. Okay, so that's a sharp opening. This is also, I think, these next two points are the two points that I find are core parts of speeches, but are done the least in speeches that I see, especially in Toastmasters. The connection between the opening and the closing. To me, it is a must. Why? Because it ties things together. It's like a bow on a package. If you put part of it in the top, but you don't go around to the bottom, it's not really tied together. It's not tight. Your speech is not tight if you don't tie that opening to that closing. And it also makes you think, when you write that speech, you think, how am I going to open? So then you start to think, how am I going to close? There are many speeches where I actually create the opening and the closing before the body points. There's some idea that I think is so important, I'm like, oh wow, this is, and the first thing I think of is, okay, how can I open that? How can I make it interesting so people want to listen? Then I go back and create the points that they're going to listen to. When I do that opening to say, how am I going to make them listen? I automatically then try and pick my closing. Okay? The best example that I can think of that, there's a speech that goes back to, I think it's Aristotle, who talks about ethos, pathos, and what's the last one? Logos. 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 
logos. So ethos, pathos, and logos. So I did a, a presentation for a rhino with ethos, pathos, and logos. And I did the Russian doll trick. I took a box, I put the large box, and it said ethos. Put that out, we talked about ethos. Then I pulled out the pathos, which was a smaller box. When I was finished, I pulled out the logos. Okay? You see also that I'm also making movement, so I also included the hologram in there too. So when I finished up, when I gave my summarizing statement, what did I do? I summarized, as I was summarizing, I was putting the boxes back in. Uh -huh. And then in the end, I said, so when you give the gift of a speech, make sure you give them ethos, pathos, and logos. My opening and my closing were exactly tied. If they didn't remember anything else, they remember that. Actually, I don't even remember a whole lot of what I said during that mm. speech. <laughs> to be honest with you, how I, you know, my colors and stuff, but I remember the opening and that closing. Find a way to open and close. So I'll tell you what, this is for you. How can we have a closing for the business meeting that we said earlier where people picked up their hands? We said, whoever's doing project one, left hand, whoever's doing project two, right hand, whoever's doing project three, stand up. What's a good closing? Henry. Oh, why me? Because <laughs> you had that look of you aren't in, in, engaged, and I can't handle that. I got to pull them in with an idea. It's so funny that you ask that question because one of the the opening, the closing I would always use in a situation like that is referred to football and what is called the Buddy Ryan syndrome. And if any of you know, remember football, Buddy Ryan was a, a defensive genius. And his teams would, be, would hold the offense of the other team to three points and still lose the game. The point is, if we don't work as a team and all the pieces work together, it does not matter if we have offense or defense or we are group one, or group two, or group three. We will lose the game. There you go. Great closing. Right. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I would add to that is I would say group one who had your left hand up, group two who had your right hand up, and group three who was standing up. And that way you close it together. Strong closing, and you tie it in. Okay? There is not a speech I have heard yet in my 42 young years of life that could not have a tied together opening and closing. And the only example I think may have been close was there was something where someone had to do something like, as a, the, the closing was really big and really important, you know, like they were doing some type of, I don't know, demonstration or something as the closing, and they, did, they couldn't say anything else at the end, that was it. You know, like if you want to end in the middle of the story to like leave, you know, that's about the only case. So there should not be a case where you write a speech from this point forward where your opening and your closing do not tie. And if I am in the room, I will tell you. <laughs> you know what, Jeff? Your opening and your closing didn't tie. You gotta tell me why. You gotta explain that. You should know that. Alright? So there should be no reason. And if there's not, email me. I will change this workshop and say there is a reason and I will add it to it if you can find a reason not to. The other thing is your transitions. There have been many occasions where I've listened to a speech and it's just kind of bounced and moved around. Now, I consider myself a semi-intelligent person and I could not follow exactly where they were going. And the reason is, they weren't giving me a road guide. Now, we're intelligent people, okay? Some people in this room may have a PhD, you might own your own company, you may be speech champions, we're all intelligent people. But guess what, as human beings, we have a short attention span when it comes to the person talking. If we want to be bored, we will read a book. Because when we're reading a book, we have different expectations. When we're reading a book, you can be slow and as boring as possible, and we'll still kind of go through it. But when you're standing in front of the room, that 30 seconds human attention span is all you got. So, if you have a point that lasts two or three minutes, you have to transition to the next point. That's one of the reasons I kind of like PowerPoint. How do you transition in PowerPoint? <laughs> <laughs> all right? But at least the audience knows I'm moving on to the next thing. All right? that's, one of the, that's one of the strengths. We're talking about PowerPoint has things that don't work and do work. But one of the things that it's awesome at is transitions because it's a click. How do you transition in your speech? Why is it important? Because in, your, in this room, there may be the geniuses who will sit and listen to everything you say and analyze and follow everything. But the majority, you've got to guide us a little bit. I'm in that majority. Guide me. Help me. Give me either a road map or tell me that you're turning right. All right. Anybody have a GPS in their car? When you get ready to turn right, don't they say, like, turn right? They don't go, like, 
Turn right! <laughs> you give them some guidance before you actually move them along. And there are many ways to do it. My favorite way, because of my style, is a physical way. It's to pick up and move something. It's to change something. It's to strategically do something. You can do the words thing, and of course the whole simple one, two, three, A, B, C. But you have to guide us. I always tell people, whenever I speak to an audience, I look at them as kindergartners. And then not challenging your intelligence, because most of you in this room are more intelligent than me. It's you have the same attention span that I do, and I have ADHD, so I have a really short attention span. That's how I look at it, and the reason why is because I won't lose anybody. Or not everybody. There are a few people I'll lose. Had too much for, you know, lunch or, you know. There's a few you're going to use, but you're going to keep the majority by letting them know where you are actually going. What are some of the ways that you can transition? Give me some examples from your own speeches or things that you've heard. What are really good transitions or really uh, uh, just um, useful transitions that you've seen? As a transition? Or it wraps up and leads into... Okay. Okay, so something that will... A quote in the middle that will end what you were talking about and then lead you to the place that you're going to go. All right, what else? You really like quotations. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe just a question. Question? Uh, with a pause. Okay, so and you're moving on to the next thing, so we're going to say. All right, how many people understand what I just covered with open and closing connections? All right, so if you understand that, what do you think about transitions? Then you transition to the next one. Okay, so question. What else? Marty Body language, give me an example. What you just did. What I just did. You can literally transition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get you to get up and do that. Alright? Give me one. What's a good transition? You can summarize what you just did. Say again? You can summarize what, what you just did. Summarize what you summarize the last point you finished yeah. before you move on. Yeah. If you tell them that if you're summarizing what you just did, people know, okay, he's finished with that point, yeah. I'm getting ready to move on to the next point. All right, what are some others? Give me at least two more, all right? Okay, how do you use what I just told you? Oh, that's a nice one. I love challenges. You finish up by saying, all right, how do you use that? Now we've learned how to use that, we're going to move on to the next thing. All right, so a transition can be a way of ending what you just talked about, beginning what you're going to talk about, or connecting the two. Ooh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Give me a second. You have just changed this workshop. <laughs> very much. All right, and one more in the back. Uh, if you have some sort of timeline in your speech, so five years ago I was here, and then ten years down the line, yes. I was here, and then you give that. Timeline is a great one. Absolutely. I have a question though. Mm -hmm. um, just thinking aloud, and maybe you can comment on this. How does the transition, um, how does that compare to the surprise element in your speech? In the surprise is you're not supposed to have a continuous change from the previous to the next one, right? You're supposed to surprise them. How does that work with that? Two responses. One, a little bit more advanced technique. As I said, this is the basic thing, right? So you're, you're cooking the advanced spaghetti. You're not cooking the beginning spaghetti, all right? Two, you can still have that, but you have to figure out where. For example, when I did the story, okay? In a storyline, the transition is what? It's a timeline. I'm talking about where she's going, what's moving, what's happening next. So I don't really don't need a specific transition there. So if you have some type of surprise element, where do you put it in your speech? The areas that the surprise element is not, you can still transition. So if you look up, if you look here, all right, so you have this, these are supposed to be like little T's. So you have a transition from your opening to starting your body, all right? So this right here could be a place where you're letting them know you finished doing the review, now you actually want to talk about it. There, is there a surprise? Maybe so. Maybe the first thing you're going to talk about is a surprise. So maybe you finish your, you finish your, uh, your uh, uh, thesis about what you want to talk about, and then you hit them with something, all right? That's still a transition, because what you hit them with is a surprise. It is a jolt from what they were doing before, so they know it's something different. So in my mind, even if you throw a surprise, the surprise usually is going to happen right here in between, so they'll still know that it is a transition. It also depends on, it really depends on where that surprise is. Where does it fall in the whole kind of structure of this? Does that make sense? Or is there a particular specific Example that you can point out. Well, no, I, I, maybe I should think about it a little more. I, I, surprise is something that shouldn't have anything. That's why it becomes a surprise because they're not expecting it. 
transition is more like, okay, you are here, hold my hand, I'll take you over there, kind of a thing. I think what he's talking about is you have surprise and you have twist. a twist. Oh, a twist, yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Two different things. Ah, okay. I would still say the same thing. Where is the twist? Okay, think of the speech, think of whatever speech you're thinking of. Where in here is that twist? This is your, going to be your opening, this is your body, this is your conclusion. All these are the transitions that happen in between. These are our road maps. Okay? Where is that happening? Where is your twist going to happen? Well, it, it could happen anywhere, actually. Okay, so the place that it doesn't happen, do you still have transitions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I'm not saying no to transitions, I'm just saying, how is that? Going? Your twist is the transition, is basically what I think of what I'm saying. Because you want the surprise, the surprise element means you're moving someone from something to something else. That is the movement, is the surprise element. That's what I would think. But we can talk about it more. Maybe I didn't fully understand the question. The last thing I want to end up here with transition is, why is the diamond the hardest natural structure on the planet? What about a diamond makes it so hard? Why can I take a diamond and cut the glass? What's the element? Any, any, phys, any people? It's very dense. It's very dense, OK? It's the bonds. It's the bonds. The density and the bonds, OK? If you tie your speech together, it makes it tighter. If you find a way to take this kind of jumbled up information that you start off with and make sure that it's in a tight format, it makes the speech tighter. It makes it stronger. It makes it more impact. Okay? If I was to come and hit you with an open hand versus if I was to come and hit you with a fist, even at that same velocity, the fist is going to have more power. That is what I find when a lot of speeches don't have Transitions is because it loses that tightness. You don't know where they're going. You don't feel the full kind of force of the punch. You only feel a couple of fingers. You only feel a little bit here and there. It's that tight transition, okay? And again, as, the, as most of you being advanced speakers, this is something that you're mostly going to use either to just kind of review what you're doing or to help teach others. You're already past a lot of this stuff, but still, you do it maybe without thinking about it. You have your natural transitions without thinking about it. That's why advanced speeches tend to be so strong. They are tight. You do see that. Okay? Any other questions in terms of transitions? And I also use the word map purposely. I used to have mark there. Map your transition because in my mind, as you were saying, it is kind of holding your hands and moving on to place to place. All of these are the various elements you have within your speeches. Okay? You have that sharp opening, that sharp closing. How do you tie them all together? How do you visually think about tying them all together quickly and easily? My approach is the Brilliant Diamond speech. If you can think about how you can put your speech in that element, or I even use it today, how I use it for speeches is I go back in my head because I don't need to see, I don't need to have it written any place, and I kind of go, all right? Sharp opening. And for me, uh, something I didn't say real, real quick here, these three points here in the sharp opening. This is the, what I call the bang element. For me, because that's when I throw something down. I do the step. I say a speech. You know, do something really strong. This right here is a drop of blood. This right here is a tear. That <laughs> opening has to be so sharp. I want you to cut into them. Okay? I want you to make them think so deeply that they bleed, or you hit them emotionally so much that they cry or laugh. Okay? That's that's when I say a sharp opening. It's got to be so sharp it cuts into you. The same thing with the closing. The one thing I change in the closing is I put a lightning bolt because I usually do, I like to do pedagogical type of things. I like to do inspiration, get you to do something. So I like to end with a challenge. For example, here, how do I end? Well, you actually want to write a speech. It's actually an exercise. I like to end with a challenge to have you go out and do something. So if I can think of this no matter where I am, one minute before the speech, two days before the speech, I can quickly in my head go, okay, so what's my sharp opening? All right, I'm going to come in. I'm going to ask them to stand up, put their hands in their pocket. All right, so what am I review? All right, this is the workshop, so I need to do the outline. I need to do the outcomes, because that's what I use for my preview and my review. I actually work through that in my head, because it's quick and easy to see. And at the end, I ask myself about the transitions, because that's the part where I am also. That is my weakest one, because I'm not great at transitions all the time. So that's the brilliant diamond speech technique. What we're going to do now is you're, I'm actually going to have you take out that second piece of paper that you have that's blank. And you don't have to do a pocket speech. You can do maybe the speech you're working on next, but I actually want you to use this technique to see how it works. It may not work for you, that's fine, 
but I want you to actually practice it right now. Think of an idea or a topic that you want to write about. It can be a topic speech, or like I said, your next speech. And I want you to use that note sheet. I'm going to come around and look. Okay? You're all kindergartners, remember? So teacher's going to come around and look. I want you to use that worksheet to actually work through and build a speech on it. Okay? Now, real quick before you do that. How do, you, how do most people go about making speeches? What are some ways that people go about creating a speech? Uh, let's see, um, well, I'm sorry, I don't know names. You're right here, sir? What's your, what's your name? Right here? Uh, how do you go about making a speech? Right now I'm thinking of a topic, something that happened recently. Okay, but I mean generally, forget, right now forget Brittany Diamond. How do you go about making a speech? What is the process you normally go through? Outline it, write it out. Outline it, write it up. And where does the topic come from? Personal experience. Okay, so that sounds. Whoops, I'll put it up there. That sounds like what we call the diamond technique. Diamond technique is it's an idea in your head. It's a rough diamond. Uh -huh. Then you start chipping away at the diamond. You outline. You start working through it. Okay. So that's one way. For example, that's how this particular whoops. That's how this particular workshop was created. I had an idea. I started thinking about all the elements, doing the research, pulling it together, and then started kind of chipping away. You know, at it. The second way is the pearl technique. That's where there's an idea in your head. It's kind of caught there. It stays there. You think about it. Every week or once a month, or just over and over, and you keep adding to it and adding to it and adding to it, and that becomes your pearl. All right? And those tend to be those speeches that are most deep to us, that we've thought about for a long time. And then there's the Superman way. That's, of course, table topics. There's a, anyone remember the 1950s Superman? You ever see that in reruns? But there's one particular episode where Superman is flying around, he does something, he helps somebody, and they drop the wedding, the, the engagement ring, off the cliff. So it's gone. So what does Superman do? Superman flies and he finds some coal mine and grabs a piece of coal and he squeezes it until it becomes a diamond. Because that's pretty much what a diamond is. It's a piece of coal that's been squeezed by you know, Earth for a million years. All right? That's what table topics is. You get thrown a topic, your brain squeezes all the information out of it to get something into a format, boom, and then you deliver it. Okay? So that's kind of the three main ways. So think about that as you're doing your topic speech. As you're doing your pocket speech, how you normally create a speech. In this case, you want to find an idea that you know enough information about right now that you can put in there. That's why, you, for beginning audiences, I always say do a pocket speech, something you know very well. But for this group, you can begin.